Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, Sunday school scholars, friends, and guests. We now come to the final chapters and conclusion of the book of Esther, which we've been studying these last few days. The Jews' adversary, Haman, has been dispatched, and as was customary, when the criminal was executed, his property now belonged to the crown. And King Ahasuerus gave Haman's house unto Esther. Esther made known to the king Mordecai's, Mordecai's relationship to her, and he gave unto Mordecai the ring which he had previously, which we read in chapter 3, verse 10, given to Haman. This ring was a signet, a symbol of the king's authority. And with this act, Mordecai was elevated to Haman's previous position as second in authority to the king. We see the providence of Yahweh here that we read of in Daniel 4, verse 17, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. Even though Haman was dead, the Jews were not yet saved. As the previous decree to destroy the Jews throughout the land still stood. So Esther, yet again, risks her life in an attempt to save the Jews. She appears again before the king, unsummoned and in a state of mourning, both conditions which could have resulted in her execution. And once again, the king extends his golden scepter, signifying that she has found favor in the king's sight. However, this time Esther requests King Ahasuerus do something that he just cannot do. That is to reverse his previous decree, which was devised by Haman to destroy the Jews that were in all the king's provinces. This decree had been written in the king's name and was therefore by their law unchangeable. The king, however, allows Esther and Mordecai the latitude to conceive of another resolution to the problem. Their only available course of action is to make another proclamation in the king's name. Even though the previous decree could not be reversed, the Jews would be given a fighting chance, quite literally, in fact, as the new decree put forth by Mordecai permits the Jews to defend themselves when they are attacked and to take a spoil of their attackers as a prey. This new decree sent out swiftly and published throughout all the provinces. Now the unchangeableness of the king's decree is typical of the unchangeable decree of Yahweh. We read it in Ezekiel 18 verse 20 that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We are all under the curse of sin and death. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all possess sinful flesh. So how are God's people to be delivered to everlasting life without also repealing the decree? We find in Romans 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. Well, the answer can be found in that very verse. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Looking back to Romans 3 verses 24 through 26, we see once again that it is by Christ that the decree is overcome. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, a covering through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And in Romans 8, verses 1 to 3, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So we see in Esther, with the condemnation of the Jews through the king's decree, the typical death sentence that hangs over all of sinful humanity. And just as in Esther, there is another decree through which the effects of the first decree can be avoided. After Mordecai's edict was sent out, he was given royal honors and publicly proclaimed as being next to the king. He was adorned in royal apparel of blue and white and purple. Here we see in, in type, Christ being proclaimed king, blue signifying heavenly origin, white his righteousness, and purple his royalty. In chapter 9, 
We see the fateful day approaching to put into effect the decree put forth by the Jews' adversaries. Because the king's command, just like the law of sin and death, could not be removed, it had to be challenged and overcome through much struggle and warfare. The type and antitype are extraordinary. We should see this same struggle in our own lives. Romans 7, Paul describes the constant struggle against the great ever-present adversary, sin in the flesh. We read in verse, verses 21 to 23, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Even though the decree allowing the Jews to defend themselves had been sent throughout the land, there were still those adversaries who desired to attack the Jews, hoping to gain advantage and possessions through the evil edict of Haman. According to Mordecai's decree, the Jews gathered together to prepare their defense. And as Mordecai waxed greater and greater, fear fell upon their adversaries, and they were not able to withstand the Jews. In the city of Shushan, 500 of the Jews' adversaries were slain, including the ten sons of Haman. And even though the Jews were allowed to take a spoil, they did not. For their desire was not vengeance or material gain, but rather deliverance and showing the glory of Yahweh. Esther yet again finds herself before the king, where she makes further petition. Esther asks for the decree to be extended a day, that Haman's ten sons, who had been executed, be put on public display in order to discourage other enemies of the Jews from attacking them. The Jews' defense was a complete success. The day in which Haman had designed to be a day of mourning for the Jews was turned into a day of celebration, a time of feasting and gladness. So in celebration of the Feast of Purim, we see the Jews' sorrow is turned to joy. Mordecai sent to all the Jews in the provinces to have all join in a feast of rejoicing. From sorrow to joy is the central theme of the Feast of Purim. In fact, this is Yahweh's main purpose with the Jews. This is clear in the 126th Psalm. We read, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves, his sheaves with him. We see also in the Feast of Purim a foreshadowing of a rejoicing nation of Israel after being regathered from wandering in the Gentile, Gentile wilderness. The Gentiles are subdued, the rebels have been purged. The word Purim is the plural of the word pur, pur which means the lot. And we saw back in Esther 3, verse 7, that her, or lots, were cast before Haman to determine the day which the Jews were to be destroyed through his wicked decree. Thus the name Purim became a symbolic reminder to the Jews that Yahweh is in control of time and circumstances. The time on which Haman's lot fell ended up being the time in which the Jews celebrated the day of great deliverance. The book concludes with a glorious millennial picture. Mordecai, Christ typified, is victorious over his adversary and is exalted next into the king. In type, we see Christ, that is Mordecai, ruling over all the earth, worshipped by all men. This book is a wonderful reminder that Yahweh is ever-present, in control of all. His divine plan will be worked out in all the earth, with or without us, and he will be glorified throughout all the earth. Let us never lose sight of this. May we each hold fast to our faith in Him. For if we do, our ultimate deliverance is assured.